Almost ready to roll. Yeah, there we go. All right. Yeah, we're live. I'm just dropping the uh, dropping the URL in for everybody. <coughs> Sorry, I'm just dropping it into the to the uh, class schedule. It's like if I do this like right now, it'll happen. And if I put it in a to-do list, it'll never happen. Alrighty, so every, uh, you guys can hear me okay, right? I am no longer muted, true? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. All right. Okay, link is in the syllabus. Um, uh, da -da 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 -da. We are live, and <clears throat> let's see. What's our body count right now? Hmm, it's a little less than 20 right now live, um, which is not the end of the world. However, um, I want to actually start today by finding my notes and giving a small fear speech to everybody. If I can find my dumb notes. Um, are people still behind on the modules? Is that what you're going to talk about? Yeah, that's the fear speech. Um, there are other fear speeches, but that's a good one. And yeah, bottom line is, where's my notes? There's my notes. Okay, here's the fear speech. Are you ready? Oh boy. Um, no, and, and the other thing, too, that I'm, what I'm really, there's a certain um, kind of drop-off rate that's normal, you know? I mean, it's, it's unfortunate, but it, it kind of, having done this now for, for a couple of years, um, we sort of know where the numbers, you know, what the, what the trend line tends to look like on average. We're actually not that, we're not really far off the trend line, but there's, there's one kind of really big thing I just want to remind everybody about, which is... After you do the homework, take the bloody exam. I don't know. Call me crazy. But like, for example, on homework, on, on module one, there are eight students who have done the homework but have not taken the exam for module one. You know? I'm sure it's not like a deliberate decision. Like, I think what I'll do is just do all the homeworks but not take the exams. It's more just planning, you know, personal management. On Can I say something about that, Dr. K? Yeah, yeah, please. So I've noticed that um, the exam doesn't open up until the TAs grade that homework. Yeah, you have to mark the homework as complete, yeah. Right, yeah, and I've had a TA, like, do it the next day, and I've wanted to take an exam. Like right on the money, right, like... Yeah, yeah, I've had... Yeah. I've, I want to take an exam, like, right after, but obviously in these kind of circumstances we can't take it like right after because the ta will probably take a little bit to get around to it but i've had, i've actually had to wait a whole day to yeah. take an exam no, that's the, a, yeah yeah that's a really really good point i really appreciate that um of course yeah. you know it's it's a and it's always a it's always a kind of a, a logistical balancing act um you know because because if i had uh, if I had my druthers, in fact, I think we actually experimented with trying to see if we could get Canvas to like, you know, as soon as you submit the homework, you know, have that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think we were trying 
And maybe we ought to revisit that. I don't know if Zach's on here yet. Yeah, Zach, you're there. We ought to, I don't remember exactly what we did, but I mean, and the reason I'm dwelling on this is it's really, really a solid point. And it was our intention to do something a lot more automatic on that front for exactly that reason. And it's mm -hmm. sort of, I really haven't thought about it for, for a number of weeks, right? So it's a really good reminder, which is why we spend a little bit of time sometimes doing the housekeeping, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I don't know, Zach, if that's, we ought to, we ought to revisit that. We ought to look back at that. I think. I just joined in. Sorry, I missed that. Sorry, man. We can't tell you what it was. No, okay. uh, we were just talking about. Hey, your... <laughs> you remember when we were trying to set up and, and we believed that Canvas could be set up so that if somebody submitted the homework. We, we were talking about the, you know, that it would open up the exam. The problem is that if somebody like submits the homework on like a Friday and they're ready to like take the exam and then, you know, by happenstance, none of us, you know, look for a day or 24 hours or whatever. Then there's that inertial, you know, you get that ability, that energy ready to go, but moment's not there, you know, mm -hmm. and it certainly would be ideal to have situations where, you know, uh, I'm pretty sure you can set canvas up to do that. I thought so too, but Zach, let's revisit it. Okay. Okay. Um, because I really want to be able to optimize to the, to the energy flow in the moment. Cause so for example, right now there are, uh, eight students that have done the homework for module one and not the exam. There are eight that have done the homework for module two, but not the exam. And, um, 12 that have done the homework for module three, but not done the exam. So I'm sorry, but whoever's on module one, they are freaking behind. If you're on module one, okay. Later. Official position is that you are freaking behind. Yes, you are freaking behind. Um, really seriously though, if you're still on module one, this is the fear of speech. You gotta, you gotta, the time is now to pound it and get caught up. And the, here's the problem. Here's the fundamental problem, um, which is this is like, this is learning a language, right? Learning, learning any, really almost any CS course. And I don't just mean programming language. I mean, the notion of here's how the von Neumann architecture works. You know, here's how, you know, we talked about social contract, right? Two's complement is a language, right? It's all languages are just, Things, you know, things that represent other things, right? So there's sounds that we make words and the words represent ideas. Dog is a word in English and it represents a, an idea. Um, and then there's just rules, right? It's just social contract. The only reason that things are, gr you know, all grammar is, is a social contract, right? Um, anyway... I'm, I'm ignoring what's going on on the uh, down there, but um, I'm not. It's a brawl. It. We, have to, we have to keep ourselves out of it. It's a brawl. It's a brawl. Yeah. I'm Mike just, Tyson and Muhammad Ali going I'm at it. I'm just going to stay up here. But anyway, but does that make sense? You know, it's a, it's a fluency issue and it's all, it's really all language. So language is uh, a social contract. Yeah. So, that makes total sense to me. Anyway. So the deal with this thing is you can't just like, you know, read the text, you know, read a, read a book on Portuguese, you know, in a day and then speak Portuguese. You can't, you, there is no possible way unless you already know this material. And I have had it, like I said, one time that a student delayed almost everything, but this particular student, A, super bright, but also was like a computer engineering major who had had basically most of the stuff so they could leverage quite a bit and just bring it, you know, into this environment, you know. So um, that's, that's a really, exception. it's very, it's very rare. Rare. and he almost yeah. didn't, he still actually almost didn't make it. You know, oh, wow. But he did. Wow. Even with that understanding, that's really crazy. Because yeah. yeah. you're still, it's just so much you're trying to bring, you know, to bear. So just keep that in mind. Um, anyway, um, 
Yeah. Okay. Um, so I just want to just, everybody, you got to get after it. I'll try to send out a message to everybody as well. And then this week we've got, um, we've got fall break Thursday, Friday. So there's no class on Thursday. And Yippee. this is your chance to go ham and you really, really, really need to catch up. We finished, we officially finished module four. I gave the, I said module four was done on last Thursday. So module four will turn into zeros on this, th this coming Thursday. Now we're technically, we're going to wrap up a couple things today about that. But really it's time for a, for a good reminder. Um, I am going to turn off those lights. Hold on real quick. All right. The backlit halo effect um, was no good. Okay, are we ready then? Let's uh, let's rock and roll. Um, the other thing I'm a little concerned about, I was looking at a count of like who's typically, you know, here when we do class live. And, we, you know, we know where there's two sections. And this is kind of section three normal time. Section four normal, normal time. Just want to remind you, you still need to... Um, still need to, you know, try to block out that time, be there, watch the videos. The, the video viewing has kind of tailed off numerically. So I'm just kind of concerned. There's that mid-semester, uh, you know, lull that, that often happens, right? Um, so just be cautious. And uh, this is very much a class that sets up uh, for a lot of success, right? I mean, show me another class at the university where you can just retake every exam as many times as you want until you get it. It doesn't exist. So there's no, it really is also a class that if you, if you fail it or do poorly, you know, and we're super available. So there's, there's not, it's really on you, you know, I mean, honestly, you know, we're doing everything we can to be supportive, but it comes down to self-management and you got to do it. So, all right, that's end of that speech. Okay, um, let me see. Should we talk about some uh, technology? I think we should. I did. Hey, Chris. <laughs> Hello. Uh, was that a response, or was did we just catch a hot mic while you were yawning? No, I was just teasing. I was like, oh, okay. all right. I guess we can talk about technology. We can talk I technology. only came to this class. <clears throat> That's right. Okay, quick review on, on finite state machines. Okay? This is, these are the fundamental ingredients. Now, this is really... I want to say something really important. The format of, of, what, it, of what a finite state machine needs to look like... There's no standard. I mean, there are state machine diagrams in UML, and some of you have already had, you know, something where you have to learn UML, which is a, it's a kind of a diagramming standard, right? Um, uh, UML, um, what is that even? Universal modeling language. Uh, so there's a state machine, you know, there are state machine diagrams in UML, but uh, uh, there's no real standard. So as long as you have states that you can move through, okay, inputs coming into a state, outputs when you're in a state, and some specification for what you do when you're there and how you and when you kick out and go to the next one. As long as you can, these are the five kind of core ideas. If you've got these five, after that, it's just aesthetics. It's just you know, what looks good, okay? And I'll show you some examples of what kind of looks good or not. We talked about the traffic light. Um, here's another one that we, we kind of looked at it but didn't get all the way into, which was, um, what about these? Anybody uh, recognize these, right? These are the little turnstile units, right? Uh, for coming into like a subway or a train station, that kind of thing, right? Um, right, there's kind of, Here's the reality on this one. When you look at modeling and looking at a system and try to model it with a state machine, um, 
you can look at it really granular. Like in this case, there are really two states, locked or unlocked. But the reality is that depending upon the inner workings of the machine, um, you know, there, there, there are in reality far more states internally. You know, for example, this guy has, um, these look like the little swipers, like the little card swipe things. Is that right? Um, yeah, and there's another one probably, no, or, or there were some anyway. I've seen some subways where as you're walking in, you throw your ticket, your little paper, whatever, with a little mag stripe, and it goes in and like travels in and pops out as you're coming through and you grab it on your way out, right? Well, if you look at that, there's kind of like a ready state where it's locked, and then there's a state where you're actually, and uh, you know, a ticket has been entered, right? And the ticket's being read. There's that ticket being processed kind of state, right? And then there's a part where it's going to unlock the, the, this is my, this is my impersonation of unlock, um, where it's going to somehow disengage so the, the little spindle can turn, right? Yeah, so Mike, Mike, I bet, I bet, I mean, that may be, that's certainly true. But what about subways? That's my question. Like there's a UTA too. There's a like UTA police that go on and check if you have yeah. a ticket. Yeah. Interesting. 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 Okay. Um, and so then that little spindle thing can turn, but then you're also in the state of it's in the middle of turning where it can like snap back, but you know what I mean? It's got to move then you got to move it to that, to that, you know, thing. And, um, and then you're, you know, then you grab your ticket or whatever. I'm just saying that there are more, you know, states involved than just two. But you can also just view it as it's in the locked state. And then when someone presents payment or a ticket or something, then it's in the unlocked state. Right. Um, I am. Oh, nice. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. This is exactly what it is. That's a hilarious gift. <laughs> That's that really mad. It really fits. That's, awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah. <clears throat> I like that. Um, okay. So yeah, this, yeah, right. This is it. This is the state machine. It's locked. You get payment. You get to put in the unlocked. They rotate the turnstile and it puts it back in the locked state. Ta-da. That is a state machine with two states. Um, there is a, uh, I think one of the homework is some homework problems asks you to just build a little state machine with like three states and it just, you know, can be just about anything. And it's just trying to give you, you know, the means to, to process this idea just a little bit more where we are not persnickety at all about that. As long as you know, like what style or what, you know, what has to be there. It just has to be like, yeah, that's, you know, that's a state machine like that right there. You can't reuse this one. But that's just fine for what we're looking for. That's fine, except that it's only two states. Okay, we talked about oh, we talked about the the padlock, right? Now, if if hey, I Kirk had and I are going to grandfather's. Okay. Uh, what? Are we hot mic in here? Okay. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Hey, whoever whoever four three four one four is. Yeah, I think you're hot mic and hello. Okay. Um, yeah, so what we would do on the if we were in classroom setting, we tended to do this one on the board. And you know, we don't really have that. Let me see. Somebody know, let me see. Can we Anyway, whoever you are, 434. I just messaged him, so. Okay, awesome. Yeah, if you know who that is, shoot him a message. And, you know, I look at it this way. CS majors, we shouldn't have hot mics. I just think we have the power over the technology. You know what I mean? We're the masters of the technology. I understand there are other folks that, whatever, you know what I mean? It's like the computer is so intimidating. I think we should be better than that. Um, and I can also do a, I can do a force mute, but I think it only clears it for me. I think you can still hear it. 
Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that next, uh, next time I get a sound. But here's what I want to do. Uh, and really, at this point, we, we don't have the whiteboard. And, but I just want you to... Uh, you can see my little, my little cursor arrow, right? Adequately enough. Like a little, oh, little yeah. mosquito. Yeah, it's really small, um, but yeah, I can yeah. see it. Yeah, well, the idea yeah, would be... All right, thanks. So the idea would be that you're in this A state, right? Which you're in this starting state, which is when you take the padlock and you zig, 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 you know, it's like locked. It's, it's you know, whatever. Kind of in a neutral state. Um, what, you know, what's the, what's the transition? And there's the combo right there. There's our combo. You go right 13. And then you notice on these locks, you have to go like right to the number, then left like past the number once and back around to it, right? And then back right, you know, to whatever that number is. So right 13 is the first number. So what would be your transition? So state A is just the locked state, okay? That's just the locked state. Um, what's the next state you have to get into and how do you get there? That's really the two questions. What do you think? I'm waiting. Sorry, what was the question? Yeah, the question the question is what what is state B? So state A is just the locked state, right? You show up, you got a padlock, it's locked. State B is well the question is what's the first state you have to get to and what do you have to do to get there? Right? So what's the action that triggers you into state B and what is state B? So turn it right 13 to get to state B and then that gets it ready to do the left. State C. Yeah. Well, yeah. right. And and the key is turn it right as many times as you want until it gets to number 13. You may you might not be turning it right 13 uh, you know, spots, but you move it uh -huh. right until until it's right until that guy right there is looking down at, at number 13. Okay. Now you could also make that finer tuned. Like you could say, I click it once to the right and every single movement to the right could be a separate state, right? Like I click it. So if I'm spinning it, just spin, 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 spin. I'm staying right here in this first state. I'm still in the locked state, right? But as soon as I stop it on, on, number 13, like pause and then head back left, I'm in this second state, which we would call, you know, we could call that state R13 if we wanted to, right? When I'm in the R13 state, you know, then there's like, there's all the things I can now possibly do are the drivers. So for example, what if I, what if I get to R13, you know, I turn right until it's on 13, and then I just turn it right some more. Where am I? What state am I in at that point? Yeah, you're still in state A. Yeah, exactly. Now you could say, you could say that as soon as I was on our, you know, 13, that I was in state B and that'd be reasonable. But as soon as I moved it one more, I would go back to state A. You know, so I probably think of it that way. You know, as I'm moving it right, if I spin it really fast, every time it passes 13, I'm in state B. And every time I keep going, I'm back to state A. Right. But if I get to state, you know, state B by stopping at 13 and just pause and then start heading back, I'm, I'm really solidly in state B at this point. Right. Now I got to go left past 22 and then back around again to 22. And really, it's the exact same thing. If I go, if I start to go left and I then pause, I panic, and then I go right, what state do I transition to? What say you? So I went, I went right until I got to 13. Then I started going left, like, like, you know, like I, like a good, good little kid, I go left and then I, but I, then I kind of like panic, I pause and then I go right again. 
What state does that put me in? A. Right? Exactly. I'm back to locked. So anything I do, like I got to go right until 13, then I got to stop, then I got to go left, past 22 and around to 22 again, stop, go right to three, stop, and now the thing's open. If I do literally anything else, I go back to A. I just transition back to A. It's kind of like, I don't know, shoots and ladders. I don't know what they're, they're, they're games, right? Where you're like trying to make your way through and sometimes you like get bounced back. You know? In fact, I just realized that there are probably a bunch of games that are like, um, I don't know, that are essentially finite state machines. Um, okay, hang on a second. All right. Um, yeah, give that, give that some thought, you know. Um, like when, you, when you're playing Monopoly, let's take Monopoly, for example. Uh, you roll the dice, right? And then if it says like five, then you move five spaces and now you're in the state of being on that, you know, on that square. And then from that, depending upon a bunch of other dynamics, I might do a bunch of things. I might go, you know, whatever, go directly to jail. I don't know. There's like these different things, you know. If I pass go, I get 200 bucks. You know what I mean? There's just, it's, it's really could be modeled. It can be modeled with a state machine. Um, anything that, that moves you through different states, a uh, lot of games, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of games take you through those kinds of states, right? To, you're in the started state, you're in this whatever, whatever it happens to be. Anyway, at every time, if it's a little more impressive when we do it on the board, and maybe, maybe I need to animate this guy now, because like I said, typically I just jump on the whiteboard and, and kind of go for it. But um, does, that, does this kind of make sense? It's really, it's really, it, it's a simple idea. When you draw this thing, all of a sudden, you can go just, you know, the lines start going everywhere, you know? Yeah, um, that makes sense. But one thing you can do in every, in every one of those positions, in every one of those states, you can do something to stay in the same state. And that, usually we just draw that. Here's my circle. The arrow just goes like that and points back to itself. Does that make sense? Um, actually, I got my magic whiteboard. But we usually represent it with something like that. That would be like I'm in the locked state and I'm just like spinning that thing, you know, uh, for all I'm worth. I, every time that I'm every touch, every move, it just stays in the locked state every single time. And then when I successfully do the thing it looks like that okay and that means i'm moving it right i'm moving it right i'm moving it right and finally uh i'm on number 13 so when i'm on number 13 i transition to this b state and then if i do anything bad you know i just go back to the a state but if i if i can start going left you know, then I, I basically, I just keep building it up. And in, in some cases, I go through certain states like the alarm clock, right? Which when the alarm clock goes off, it plays whatever it's set up to play. There's an action being performed. Here, there's no action other than when you get to D, it actually does unlock the lock. And that's the action that happens within that state. So, question. Yeah. So... One state cannot operate without the other unless the previous state is accomplished. Is that correct? So if A is not accomplished, then B will not be able to accomplish. Um, yeah. If, if, if C, you know, kind of A, B, C, D in a row, one has to function with, with the other one. That's right. In, order the, to in other words, um, we, could, we could use a term like dependency, you know. Oh, okay. That's a good word. You know. Another way to look at this, imagine just your life, you know, most of you are in your 20s and, you know, so let's just say you're 25, your life could be modeled at some level as a series of, you know, 26 states, each designated by birth and a birthday so that all the triggers 
right? How old are you? It's a discrete, by the way, speaking of that, how old are you actually? That's a really nice sort of uh, back to analog versus discrete, right? We didn't use this example, but, but you know, the analog the answer- age Compared to your year age, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Your actual age is actually, is changing in real time. It is, it, by seconds, right? By, no, by, by infinitely small units of time that you can't even differentiate. Oh, that's that true. They're just yeah. stringing together. Oh, Morgan, you use that on your test? I hope you got oh. all the points on that. Um, but then if you turn around and say, how old are you? You go 25. That's not true. And if somebody goes, it's, it's true, but not true. It's true when viewed from a discrete perspective. It's not true when viewed from an analog. You always lose information when you discretize. All right, Zach must have graded that one, <laughs> um, right? So, if, and if you ask somebody, how old are you? Um, and you're like, uh, I have 25 years, eight months, three, you know, and 23 days. And yeah, look like you're a weirdo. You really, yeah, you're, you're yeah, it is. It, that's odd. That would kind of violate, you know, the normal kind of, you know, expected social contract because people actually yeah. aren't asking you for that. And there's always that class when, you know, that classic, like, so when's the big day? And then the answer is like 42 days, 39 hours, you know, 12 hours, whatever. Yeah, I can't do math. You know what I mean? And 42 seconds. You're like, Hmm. You, you know, <laughs> my, the grandpa, the grandpa part of me just goes, uh, that might not end well, you know. Um, yeah, you know what I mean? It's a little bit weirdly obsessive. Like, that's a big, you know, yes, it's a big thing. I'm, you know, I'm not trying to take away from that, but I'm just saying uh, it's a level of obsessiveness that doesn't bode well. Okay, but the discretized answer is 25. And when you're like six or five, whatever, three, you go like, how old are you? Four and a half. Cause, cause the granularity when you're only four, you know, you're like, no, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm four years old in 10 months. I'm almost five. You know what I mean? That, that, that half a year is, is a solid like 10% of my life. You know what I mean? I'm going to count it. it. The, 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 the granularity is, you know, is too big when you're five, when you get my age, you know, how old are you? How old are you, Chuck? You know? Eh, you know, I'm in my 60s, you know, it doesn't much matter. You know, every, you know, everything past 60 is basically like dead or close to it. You know what I mean? It all becomes like this equivalence class uh, because the granularity actually gets, you know, every year, you know, you get to that point where you, you actually forget what year you, what, how old you are because you've been thinking of a number near there or whatever. It all just honestly blends. When you're four, four and a half is a big deal, right? Exactly. That's me right there. That's me in another uh, two years. Um, anyway, yeah, 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 yeah. So I think that's a great example of discrete, um, you know. But anyway, but you could view your life as a, as a state machine, right? That just goes, you start in the birth state, you start in the pre-birth state, however, you know, wherever you want to start the state. And then you're like, you're in state zero years old or first year of life, Right? And then you, you have a birthday and at midnight on a certain, which is arbitrary, discretized at midnight, you're like, I'm now one. You don't say that because you're still drooling at that point, but you know, I'm one and I'm in the state called one years old. Now that's a very boring state machine. You know, it just moves state by state by state, triggered by birthdays and cut short by death at some point truncated, you know, at some point you move to the dead state. And that's a very, it's a very boring state machine, but that is a state machine. And there are dependencies. You've got to be given the linear march of time, uh, to the, you know, I guess go see Tenet, go see Tenet. No spoilers. I can't even spoil it. If I tried, I don't understand it. And I saw it. I'll go back. Anyway, point just being, that you have to be four years old before you can be five years old. Unless you're Benjamin Button, you know, you, you have to be 23 years old before you're 24 years old. The dependencies are built in. That's it. 
go to the McDonald's, wherever you, wherever your fine dining is, you pull into the drive through right? The next state is they're asking you for their order. That transitions you into the giving your order state. You know what I mean? Please pull forward. That follows a state machine. That entire thing can be diagrammed out as a state machine. You know, and, and then what's happening back in the, in the little kitchen area, again, it's a state machine. Order comes in, you know, stuff goes out, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. The process of order. You have to do one thing to get the other thing. That's right. And if you remember back to when we introduced the topic, we were kind of saying, here are these memory structures that can hold on to memory, right? Right. And, and yeah. here's this other stuff that's just like, well, what do you do when stuff's just kind of flowing? Well, when you put those two together you can build a state machine. Interessante. Bingo. Okay. Sorry, I was thinking so about this lady. So if we have to lady. give an example of a state machine, does it not have to be an actual machine? We can do something like the drive through Oh, yeah, I'd rather, yeah. I, th I don't remember exactly what the question asks, but it might even be like something from the real world, like drive through Like, you know, getting my... My fro my frappuccino mochaccino latte, uh, you know, in the morning where there's a process to do that thing, you know, it's literally any process that has any sort of temporal dependency, meaning there's a time dependency where something has to happen first, then the next thing happens, and they and they need to be sort of um, clear dependencies, you know, you have to do the one thing before you do the other thing. You know. So we could use an example. So like you said, we want to explain it to somebody like you were explaining it to our little brother. My little brother likes Fortnite. So I could say like, so in order to get V-Bucks, you have to ask mom or dad for a certain amount of money to get those V-Bucks so that you can get a certain skin, right? Could that be a usable and a plausible type Absolutely. of example? Yeah, anything. All I'm trying to do, all I'm trying to do here is get you to draw some boxes and some arrows and stick some labels on them. You know, I'm just trying to get you to internalize yeah, the yeah. notion, get it away from the, get it away from the hardware and the scary circuits and, you know, et cetera. Um, yeah. So the issue with, um, I kind uh, of wish I had heard this lecture before I did the homework. Cause I, vastly overcomplicated the problem with state machines. But, I, I was drawing stuff with like logic gates and ooh, like ooh. conditions and like all of this nonsense. And then I talked with the TAs and they were like, no, 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 you just have to draw states and the arrows. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, if you had this and it was labeled, you'd be good. But yeah, so a couple of the questions David asked, can state machines jump around? Like A can go to either B or C, you know? And the answer is yes. Yes, except for the fact that there have to be like a conditional trigger, right? Um, yeah, you know, like for example, let's just take this guy for example, right? Where are we at? Yeah, notice that A, from state A, you can go either to state B or to state A, right? It goes to two places, but it only goes to state B when you're on number 13 and everything else, you stay in state A. So as long as you, now there's also what are called non-deterministic state machines, okay? But, but, a, but a deterministic finite state machine, it, it has to be, you know, it can't be like quantum, like it's Schrodinger's uh, state machine and, uh, you know, it's both on and off at the same time and blah, 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 right? You know what I mean? Um, it does have to be deterministic in the sense that in this condition I go there, and this, you know, like, for example, you go to some registration line for something, something rando, and then you look up and you're like, uh, A through K here, right? You, you, everybody comes to the same spot. Then you read the instructions, and if you're one of the A through Ks, you go to that one, and if you're whatever, L through Z, you go to the other one. But you don't. everybody comes to the standing at the head of the lines state. And from that state, given this condition, you're, you're going to go there. And with a different kind of, and we, we call those triggers, with a different trigger, you go there. So it is branching, but it's branching conditionally. It can't be like, you know, ran, now there, there are, now interestingly, once you take this idea, there's a lot of every imaginable variant of this, like including like weights, like a percentage of the time you go here and another percentage. And there's a lot of uses 
but that really just gets more into this field of directed graphs, okay, and it turn, or AKA digraphs. But, but direct, you know, a state machine is an example of a directed graph, but a directed graph is a much broader idea than a state machine. So you could think of it as, a, as an application of directed graphs. I think that's fair. So, okay, now I, I wanted to drop in before we get all the way off of this. Like, okay, but really, what does it look, what does this look like, really, when professionals, notice, pro, in scare quotes, professionals, uh, what do they do? And here's some examples. These are just, I just went looking. Notice the difference in style. This guy is, this one to me is kind of butt ugly for a handful of reasons. The font's okay, right? But this is, uh, what is this, like an uh, alarm clock, right? LEDs are blinking or they're off or they're on. Push the button. You see what I mean? There's some event, right, that you do. And then there's some, often there could be an action. You can put the action on the transition or you can put the action inside the state. Because sometimes the action is concurrent with the transition and so, you know, then leaving you in this state. And sometimes you go into the state at which point the action starts to happen. And, and, and you can argue that often as being one or the other. Okay. Excellent. Little, uh, so Jay, that's a good one. Um, a little flashback to Wolfenstein 3D. Which I played, the original. Don't be jealous. I almost threw up as well. And I don't get motion sickness. But Wolfenstein 3D. It may have also been late night, a lot of sunflower seeds, and a lot of Mountain Dew. As I recall the evening, it was not set up well for, for gastric success. And then throw Wolfenstein where there was no movement, right? It was all smooth. Uh, okay. Yeah, motion sickness from that game, and now people are playing with VR. Yeah, but they've solved the. Mo I mean, Doom solved the motion because when you're moving with Doom, it actually bobs a little bit. And with Wolfenstein, gotcha. it was perfectly smooth, and your brain uh, and your brain would just like freak out. Yeah, makes sense. Yep. Okay, so there's one. That's you know. There you go. Let's hit another one. Oh, yeah. By the way, I'm calling this one simple, which it is, right? I'm calling this one moderate. How can I possibly do that? And by the way, what is this thing? It's some kind of, uh, I can't read it. I know you can't read it. And I'm looking at the big screen and I can't read it. Uh, yeah, I no, can't read that <laughs> at all. Anyway, but the idea here is it's data communication stuff. Okay. So I'm in this like, Whatever, I'm in this null set uh, state and I, I do some kind of a setup. Point, point I'm getting at is this is not a complex state machine. Okay? I know it looks like a lot, but if you really get down to it, you've got, uh, what, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. You know, I'm seeing 16 boxes 16 states in a real system not crazy at all okay so you ready let's amp it up now there are bigger crazier ones by the way a lot of times what I've seen is uh, a diagram that that kind of talks about where stuff's going and then um, it'll just basically say to some state and then that, that state is an entirely new state machine. So it's like layered state machines extending into other state machines. But here's an example. Okay, <clears throat> this one is still, it's, it's starting to get a little bigger. But I'm just saying. It looks like a spider web. Yeah, but this is the LC3. This is the, this is the, uh, the control unit of the LC3. You know, those questions a lot of you were asking, like, how does it know to do the one thing? Who tells the, you know, who tells that circuit to say time for memory to go, right? Who makes the right enable latch? You know, how, who makes the right enable line go on and then back off? Who does this? And the answer is this does this. This every time there is in circuitry 
a state machine that runs the entire LC3, okay? It's the kind of the core of the CPU, central processing unit, right? So what happens here, and, and I would, I'm just gonna give you, a, it's a very small taste, and yeah, Cody, Cody, your life is, the, all the big answers in your life have now been, are coming now into, into light, into focus, and the trauma of your childhood always wondering who, you know, who enabled the right enable latch. You know, deliverance is nice, sir. Um, okay, but if I, I'm just gonna kind of talk about this really quick. You're not responsible for this at this point, but I wanna just give you a feel for what this is kind of doing, okay? So what it does is it takes the program counter, which tells you like, where's my next instruction? And it increments, it loads that into this memory address register which controls the memory, increments the program counter, and uh, then it goes and loads the contents of memory into the MDR, which is the data register. That it goes into the instruction register, and then it parses that instruction, and it says, okay, all that did was went out to memory, got an instruction, brought it in, okay? Hang on. Okay. I'm not sure what that means. What that, that was a good one, Jay. I don't, I just don't know what it, what it, how it exactly applies. But perhaps another GIF will help to explain that. Oh, escape from trouble. Okay. Excellent. Um, and then we just tear it apart. And then at that point, what you're going to see up here, and I know you can't even read it, but I'll read these for you. RTI add and not, uh, let me, I'm looking for stuff you know at this point. You don't even know most of these. Jump, JSR, BR, which is branch. Um, but see, like there's add. When the instruction is an add instruction, it goes over here and then notice what it says there. No, you can't notice it because you can't read it. To 18, so that goes to state 18, which is another diagram. And in that state, it does what it does. And then when it's done, it comes back up and does it again, which is actually an interesting segue into the von Neumann architecture, which includes a very important idea, which is the fetch, decode, execute cycle. Okay, which we're going to talk about. And then here's the last concept from, from this set o slides which is the clock i've talked a little bit about this right only only briefly um which is you something's got to drive this whole thing like okay go to the next state go to the next state do the next instruction do the next instruction right something has to drive it and we've got to have these regular intervals so in a digital in a digital system there's a clock circuit and it's a signal that that basically just alternates between zero and one with a regular, predictable, precise timing. So it just kind of goes like this. It's like I'm on and then I'm off and I, you know, and there's, and that's one clock cycle from I turn on, I turn off, you know, and I'm running that duration and I'm ready to turn on again. That's a clock cycle. Every time that does that, right, when you think about it, when I go high, it's like power, lines are, lines are on, boom, power, do the next thing, turn off, power, do the next thing, turn off, power, off, power, off. And I'm doing it regularly so I can actually have, have timing. And that is what is, that is what's driving the state machine that we just showed you. Cool, right? There's not a lot. I'm not going to have you be, you know, uh, accountable for the state machine, you know, for the uh, uh, a lot of the clock thing. Just understand that there's certain kinds of, you know, crystals and things that os that are, you know, have a, an, a regularly known oscillation. And uh, and then they build it and wire into it through a process called magic. Because I don't know how that works. Um, I'm sure somebody does on the planet, but it's not me. 
This example, by the way, I don't even want to go through. It's just too complex and it's just harder. But here's what I do want to just point out. I'm not going to walk all the way through this. This is a, this example, what it's trying to do is you see the little danger sign? It goes, move right, danger, move right. And what it's going to do is like turns on one and two, then it turns on three and four as well, and then five. So you get that like cascading. Does that make sense? I should animate this. Zach, make me, don't even do it, Zach. But yeah, this is the danger zone. <laughs> oh, Kenny Loggins, we've missed him so much. Uh, and Tom Cruise. Um, but what it's doing is it's lighting up one and two, then it lights up three and four, and then it lights up five. You see my animation? Do you see my incredible animation here? I can't even do it. There it is. Brilliant. Um, and then you get a little, it just gives you the moving arrow. That's all it's giving you is the moving arrow. So what it's doing basically is it's transitioning to the part where one and two are on. Then it transitions to the part where one, two, three, and four are on. Then it transitions to the state in which they're all on. And then it turns them all back off. That's all that's doing. Okay. And the rest of it, it don't matter much. But what's cool is that you can, again, I'm not going to get deeply into it, but remember we talked about combinational logic circuits. I can build circuitry to do whatever I want. So I've got memory. I got to remember what state I'm in. I, you know, I've got to have this in my circuit. I got to remember, you know, what, what, what uh, state I'm in. And then the clock comes in and every time the clock pulses, that splits out. Okay. Every time the clock pulses, it controls, you know, what's going on in the storage. The, the storage, I, you know, things feed in. There's a switch that's turning stuff on. And you tie that together. And you can take that logic circuit and break it down. And it's just a, like a revisiting of the abstraction, right? Like there's a logic circuit. That's a little memory element, okay? Just to try to show you that that state machine kind of actually looks like this when you build it in hardware and each of those pieces break out into things we've already talked about. That's all that's trying to show you is that kind of like, you know, high level view. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So Jay, that, that, that gif is going to cause me to, yeah. Epileptic seizure. Thank you. Um, okay. Very last thing we're going to hit. I'm having a quandary because we're actually only now finishing module four. I don't know, Zach. Do we have the everybody turns to zeros on Thursday or on a week from Tuesday? Thursday. I think Thursday still because it's fall break and everybody needs to, you know. Kind fall of, break, everyone. If you're not done by with module three by now, like. Okay. Hey, Doctor Ted. Yeah. Can you unlock the rest of the homework and stuff? I have all of them done. Uh, yeah. DM uh, DM Zach right now. Actually, is a okay, good way cool. to do that. <clears throat> then we can deal with that in particular. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay. So here's the last thing I want to show you, and this is really, really important. Okay. Remember, remember that the LC3 is our little mocked up FACO computer. It's not a real computer. You can build one. It's been done. You can build one in Minecraft. That's been done. You can build one with various circuit building tools. But it's an abstraction. It's a, there's a, we have a simulator, okay? Simulator, kind of simulator emulator, um, depending upon how you view those terms. Okay, here it is. Now, this is one of those things where you have to just like, you know, get a paper bag, start breathing into it, you know, like don't, don't panic. The stuff that's all over here, before we're done, before we're done here, y'all be wearing gold-plated diapers. Um, before we are done, 
it'll actually make sense. And there's a lot of grungy detail you don't need to worry about. But there is an idea. There is a concept called, thank you. There is a concept called a data bus. It's called a bus. B-U-S, bus. And I noodled over, thank you, thank you for the Christopher Walken gif. Um, uh, you know, never question Bruce Dickinson. Uh, the data bus is, it's just a bunch of wire. It's just a bunch of wire. But everything, notice that that like, tie, every, all these lines that tie into it up there, down here, right, and over there. When you, when you need to um, move something, right, from point A to point B, somewhere in the computer, you have to put stuff on the bus, and then that whole bus is like lit up with those, with those values. Now, what you're going to notice up here is, see that gate here that goes MUX, multiplexer? Um, there's just this gate for the program counter. They're all gated so that there are ways of controlling whether stuff like gets out there or not. So only one of the components can put stuff on that bus at the same time. And then only one of them is instructed by the CPU to read. Yeah, the big thank you. I didn't make that clear, David. The big thick line, the big yellow one is the sun. The, uh, the big thick line right there goes around it. That's the bus. That's the data bus. Now, literally one way to think about this it's figuratively, but you can literally think about the following figurative representation. You know how on campus, back when we used to be on campus, and there is this campus bus? There's like these bus, what do they call them? Back when I was in Iowa City, we called it the CAM bus, which is clever. Um, but I don't, what, do we have, is there a name for this, the buses that roll around UVU? Are they called shuttles? Do we have a, I mean, they are shuttles. Are they, do we have a fancy name for them? No, I don't know. Anyway, I just wondered if we had like a name for them. UVX? Really? Okay. If someone wants yeah, to. Yeah, it's called UVX. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not just a, that's not a, that's the name of that shuttle system. Correct. Okay. Yep. UVX. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah, I'm stuck in Iowa City, man. It's still the 80s and I'm in Iowa City and we had the CAM bus. But it was the same idea, right? And the reason you have that UVX is you got people on the West Campus, right? On the other side of the freeway. And, mm -hmm. and then you've got the kind of the main, whatever we call that, main campus. And then there's just some other spots, right? Where there's a few buildings. Isn't there stuff like south of the parkway, maybe even? I believe so, yeah. You got yeah. different connections in different areas. Yeah, so that UVX, it, it runs around, right? It just makes, it's just looping all day long. It's looping. You pick it up, right? And that way you can get you over where like all that parking is, like all that UTA parking, right? Over on the west side, um, on the other side of the, the railroad tracks, cross freeway, right? So, so all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Not exactly right. Um, <laughs> that's it. Thanks, Zach. Um, yeah, that's it, man. You're riding a bus. So it's, it is conceptually... Okay, it doesn't implement exact. There's not like little things that you put your data in. They run around, you know, little, little, whatever, um, little shuttle buses. But but the idea is still the same. That if, for example, um, you know, this CP over here does some stuff, whatever, and then it needs to put something out to memory, it has to put it on the bus. And then it just appears everywhere on that bus. Um, that kid is a solid one. And it has to everywhere on the bus. And then the CPU has to tell the MAR to go ahead and read from the bus. That, so, so up there, the CPU puts the address on the bus. Then the memory address register reads it from the bus. Remember that picture of memory, right? With the three bits per byte and the four bytes. Remember that whole thing? And I was like, data's just kind of hanging out up here. And like, what if the data changes? And we're like, nothing happens until, right? We had that line coming in that was like, we're going to enable, you know, whatever. It's the same idea. I want to I put something in memory. So the first thing I've got to do is put the address on the bus. CPU says, everybody shut up. You go on the bus. 
Now it's on the bus, and over there it's like nobody pay any attention to that. You over here, memory address register, pull it on in. That's that part where we latched it into memory. Now it's in that register. And then the CPU is again running through the state machine. We did that, now it's the next thing we have to do. Oh, we gotta get the data ready to go. So it'll take the data and put that on the bus. And then over here in the memory data register, it'll say, you read that off the bus. Everybody else ignore it. Everybody can see the bus kind of like at all times, but the CPU controls through the, the decoders, the stuff that we did, it's exactly that stuff. It controls, you can, you can write, you know, what you're gonna do is gonna go, what you're saying is gonna go on it and everybody else be quiet. And then you're gonna read it, everybody else ignore it by just turning on who gets what line. Kind of amazing. But, and it's walking through a state machine. Get the address, put it on the bus, go tell this guy over here to pull it off the bus, get the data, do the thing. Then there's another you know, set of instructions that's like, okay, now you, MDR and MAR, you're literally just like the picture we did with the little 12-bit memory. And it's like, ready to go, boom, 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 latch it all in just like we did. And then, you know, and you see down here, mem.n rw that's like the the enable that's uh like a write enable read versus write you know which way are things going in and out it's just all the stuff we talked about is that cool all the inputs all the outputs the memory there's the instruction register logic stuff there's there's the state machine right there see this finite state machine that's the state machine that's running the whole shebang. There's the ALU, which is the arithmetic logic unit or the arithmetic logic unit, depending upon how pretentious you want to be. There is um, what? That's just control stuff. That's, uh, these are the registers, the local registers. And there's the program counter. Yeah. I mean, really, that's kind of it. And we're going to break this down. As we get deeper into the machine, we're going to break it down. Oh, yeah. Official, official. Okay, that is solid, certified, official. Done with Module 4. And, it's, and we're going to make it turn to zeros on, on Thursday. Yeah, the kid's a solid one. Yeah. <laughs> Jump over to Discord. Look, Discord's here. Jump over to Discord, check out the GIF. Little kid, I'm on the bus. Super cute. Actually looks kind of like one of my grandkids. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, everybody on who's watching this on YouTube, jump over to Discord, you know, scan back. And in fact, you can also add your comments later to Discord if you'd like and join in and, you know, with your own, you know, whatever. Whoever else wants to respond at that point, comment. But no, yeah, is he a one or a zero? He's a one. In fact, I would go so far as to say every person in a seat is a one, every empty seat is a zero. That actually weirdly kind of works. Oh, module four. It's in the books. Now, you're probably thinking, but Dr. K, we have 10 more minutes. We, are, we have an insatiable appetite for this stuff. I know. That's why I'm not done. I got more to do. But I'm just going to roll you straight into uh, Module 5, which is Chapter 4 stuff. Okay? Ready? I am. You know what I like about that kid on the bus? He's, he's so freaking proud. He's just so happy. You know what I mean? He's like... He's like, oh, yeah. You know what I mean? He's got that kind of, oh, yeah, living large on the bus. Exactly. The bus is parallel. Well, so the, no, no, no. That bus full of people is also parallel, Zach. Right? It's moving like, if there are like 16 seats on that bus, they're all moving together. Zeros and ones moving together. No, you don't suppose. You know. You know I'm right. And you need to get over it. Okay. And you know who else was right? John von Neumann. <clears throat> Credited as being the father of modern computing. It's, it's interesting because there's, you know, if you, look, if you actually look at the history of computers, you know, 
Um, there are a lot of people, whoo, there are a lot of people that were involved, did cool stuff, you know, had influence. Um, some have argued that von Neumann doesn't deserve to be the father of computing um, because there were just others innovating, whatever. But he was, but he was one of them, and uh, I'm not going to debate the semantics at this point. But the the modern computer architecture does uh, get named after von Neumann and is called the von Neumann architecture. Okay, and weirdly, the von Neumann architecture, we're coming around on about. Uh, uh, 80 years, eight zero. That's even older than me by a few months. The eight zero <laughs> years of use. That's so. Think about it. Computers, modern computers, and you've got a fundamental like idea of how these things work, and you just and that's it for 80 years. Almost a hundred years. I mean, there's a lot of innovations, you know, don't, don't get me wrong. Bazillion innovations, not Brazilian. There were probably Brazilian innovations as well. But I'm talking about the number bazillion, you know what I mean? Not the nationality bazillion. Um, but isn't that a little crazy? 80 years for a computer idea, and that's like still the idea? That's crazy. And, you know... Obviously, over a hundred years for just the notion of binary stuff. So von Neumann was kind of crazy, you know, math, physics, uh, econ, stats. Okay, this one, this one just creams me, man. At age six, he could divide two eight-digit numbers in his head. Divide. I mean, kind of similar to Mozart. Mozart was also a, uh, a prodigy. prodigy. He could write full sonnets at the age of seven. Yeah, crazy, right? Crazy, crazy. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I couldn't have, I was probably in my 20s before I could like add, you know, eight digit numbers in my head. Some of you are still like, wow, you could add, how, how could you possibly do that? Um, that's crazy. Anyway, could converse in ancient Greek. I don't know. How do you know this? Are you, uh, how many, you're like, yeah, because our, our pool guy was an ancient Greek. And then he just talked to that guy, you know, the whole time when he was there working on the pool. I don't know how you test that out. He, he understood differential and integral calculus, apparently when it was age uh, eight. I don't understand that now. <laughs> you know what I mean? I had it. I passed those classes. I don't, you know. Anyway, it's a little crazy. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, okay, he founded the field of game theory. That's tight. He created the merge sort algorithm, which was built on the EDVAC computer. So he was clearly a historical force and a crazy, crazy brilliant guy. This is, there were really a couple of things about the, about the von Neumann architecture, okay? One is this idea right here with a, a, a central processing unit and then memory, input, output. I mean, that was like, you're like, well, you know, I guess you have to speak ancient Greek to do this. Apparently, um... Yeah, you have to understand, right? If you're Charles Babbage, this is blowing your ever-loving head. And uh, so we're going to break this down and, and introduce these pieces because you need to understand, you know, what these pieces are. The other thing that, that was kind of central to the von Neumann architecture, and it, you can kind of see it here, but it's not explicit. The idea that, that, that code and data were just contents of memory. Okay? Let me just say that again. Code and data were all just stuff in memory. The idea that I would have what they call the fetch, decode, execute. That's important to just remember this, probably for your whole career. Fetch, decode, execute. What that means is I go out to memory and I fetch the next instruction. I take my program, I load it into memory, right? When I double click on an icon, it, the, the operating system takes that, 
takes the code and starts putting that code into memory. And then if you're going to run it, it sets the instruction pointer to the first instruction of that program. Then when you go fetch, it fetches right there, pulls it in, decodes it, figures out what to do with it, and then it executes it. And then it increments the program counter and grabs the next instruction, fetches that one, decodes it, executes it. And all the CPU does, that control unit, all it does is just fetch, decode, execute. That's its whole purpose. Is that a true story, Ison? That for those on you, for those yeah, on I just YouTube, read it. he just he looked at his mom and asked her, "What are you calculating?" <laughs> Instead of "What are you thinking?" Like <laughs> the kid says that at six. That's Would awesome. Would you ever have, a, have your That's son or your daughter look up to you and say, "What are you? What are you calculating?" You calculating? Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. I can't fathom that, yeah. Oh man, yeah. I was reading more about him too. He um he apparently had tutors that he would hire for him. Yeah. And yeah. one tutor thought his mathematical like thinking process was so good that it brought the tutor to tears. He literally cried. Wow. Cuz he, he was astounded by von Neumann's um com computational analysis of everything. Wow. Yeah, pretty cool. Thanks, man. That's awesome. Yeah. That's cool. Smart guy. Smart guy. What are you calculating? <laughs> I'm going to start actually just... I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to start using Dr. that. Dr. K, what are you calculating? What are you calculating? Yeah. You just did a random... You're just with your roommates. Your roommates just sitting there. You're like, dude, you seem preoccupied. What are you calculating? I think it... I think let's all just... Should we all just try to do that? Maybe report back with a Kevin Hart uh, gif or something? Hey, man. Um, Genius leaves clues. Genius leaves clues. <laughs> I know. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, there was actually one other story. Mm, I want to, I think it was about von Neumann though. Now I got to double check. It was von Neumann out for dinner and the, and the, um, uh, the check came and they'd miscalculated the check. They were going to like, and, and they had like undercharged so that there was a savings of like, you know, a dollar 62 or something. And then von Neumann was like, talking to the they're all like mathematicians or whatever but he was like talking about like the three different ways they could like divide the spoils on that right that were kind of mathematically pleasing of course he had the numbers all in his head and then whoever was writing the story said it, it never dawned on him that they could actually just let the server know and actually you know like give it back you know that was not in the didn't show up in the equation so no. anyway so here's what we're going to do. We're actually, it's 2.15. We're on, we're on, yeah, we're on time. What we're going to do, just so you know what's coming, this is our, our overarching picture of von Neumann architecture. And then we're going to break it up and look at each of the chunks to just introduce you at a high level to what that is. Then later on, we're going to drill down more and look, we're going to go back to that LC3 picture. We're going to go back over and over and over again for the rest of the semester to that LC3 picture. And it really, if you just like relax, take a cleansing breath and just don't, don't sphincter up because it's too many lines and too many boxes. Just like, you know, Dr. K will guide you through the, these, this is what we care about now. And it'll start to kind of just distill, but it takes time, takes fluency. Okay. And it's, it's study of language. So you got to have some time, some distillation, some immersion that brings the fluency, you know, you cannot cram this into your head any more than you can, you know, read a book on Portuguese and speak Portuguese in the last five days. You know, you'll learn a couple things. Juan, Juan, obrigado. That's all you're going to know. You know what I mean? Five days later. So, which is by the way, all the Portuguese I speak just FYI. Um, and Juan Juan is just a random sound. It's not even, I'm not trying to say a word on that one. Uh, it's just the sound that people in Brazil make. From my perspective, and then over to go. All right, so listen, we're out of time. We're done. Um, we're going to be rocking and rolling th uh, this, so no Thursday. So we'll probably spend next week Ooh, on this module. Yeah. We should get through this module next week. And did you say that um, the next up, um, assignment will be due on Thursday? So um, the, uh, module four is, is due on Thursday because it says it. 
looks like it's due on yeah it's due on thursday i think on the 15th uh, yeah okay, okay. All right. i thought it's wednesday tomorrow but it was changed i guess or some, or maybe i misread it but yeah awesome Thank and you. then, yeah, you bet. So anyway, if you guys want to pile out, uh, Zach asked the question, didn't I chill out on a yacht in Brazil? And not technically in Brazil. I would, pro I would probably call that off the coast of Brazil. Um, but yes, I did once spend a day on a yacht off the coast of Brazil. That was a really, really good day. I just want to say that. So Mike... Um, yeah, the final the final project is assembly, man. There's no C here. Don't bring your don't bring your weak sauce high level programming language to this game. Get out of here, man, with your with your high level for loops and crap. No, we're we're grinding, baby. We're grinding assembly here. So yeah, yeah, the final project is uh Yeah, it is a yeah, Mike. Yeah, C is in the C is in the book. Yes. Yes, it is in the book. Anyway. So anyway, anybody, anybody wants to bail right now, I wanted to actually throw out another question for anyone that wants to stick around for just a couple minutes, but um, for everybody, you know, everybody else, lecture time is kind of over. But I, I debated and still do debate the idea of flipping the class upside down and instead of building from circuits and working our way kind of up to the architecture, machine language, assembly language, and then, you know, sort of some of these other ideas, the idea would be um, maybe to start with C to start with the C programming language and some basic things where you might do like, you know, here's a, here's an if then else statement or just an if statement, or here's simple statements in C and actually like convert those into assembly. No, we're not doing C Mike. I'm, 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 uh, I'm conceptualizing about the future, about the possibility. Yeah. Would this be a good idea, right? To start with some C, um, I don't know. What do you What do you think? <laughs> Thanks, Zach, for having my back on that one. Yeah, man. Let me let me conceptualize here. Uh, but it, would that be? You know, I mean, you're you're kind of working your way up, and we're going to get to how instructions work, and then machine language, and then assembly language. But what would happen if we started? You know, actually started with C actually did have C, whereas in now we don't, and whereas in now is a new expression in, in our language that I just created. But, you know, whereas now we have none of that, Would if you started with C and then use that as your way to kind of like work down into assembly, what, I, just, what, are, your, what are your thoughts? Would that be a good thing, bad thing? It's going to be pros and cons. It's not going to be like, clear. You know, there's no like, obvious right or wrong on that what do you think just from your perspective and you know no right or wrong on that what say you yeah so zach Zach threw out, you know, maybe with everybody coming from Python, which most of you are coming from Python, we might end up focusing on the C too much. That's, that is a risk, honestly. That is a risk. We wouldn't do like crazy C. We wouldn't do crazy, you know what I mean? Weird pointer crap and stuff like that. <laughs> Nice. Excellent work, Mike. Extra credit for Mike. 0. 0.0001 points on the assignment of your, on the homework of your choice, Mike, for dropping uh, LC3 assembly on us to make your point. Um, I don't know. Any, any, y y you got nothing? Anybody? Hmm, Michael, the Python is throwing you off. Yeah. Well, the Python to C or C++ leap is pretty pretty big. Python is basically writing pseudocode for C++. <laughs> that's that's is, all it is. Yeah, yeah. No, actually, you're right. You're right. Pseudocode with, like, some strict rules. But, but yeah. That's true. Then C++ is a little like pseudocode of C, and then C is pseudocode of assembly. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. So yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm noodling over it. I'm new. I'm just kind of noodling over it. it. There's a there's a limit to how many new ideas you can drop in, and C is not like native to everybody going in. What well, native to almost none of you going in? That's the truth. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Well, hey, listen. I'm gonna I'm gonna shut down my stream. And uh, I'm going to do that first. And uh, I will see everybody in one week. Get all your stuff done. Get your stuff Thanks, done. Thanks, Dr. K. Yeah, you bet. I'm actually, I'm actually like halfway done with the vinyl project in assembly. So I was just checking to make sure if I was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, nice. Uh, if, if I had to go back and redo anything. So. No, uh, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Good thing you didn't do it in C, right? Have you yeah. taken this class before, Mike? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, yes. But no. I, I have a little bit of a programming experience, so... Yeah. Um, Man, I mean, anybody who can get that rolling because of the module system, you can crank it all out, you know, out in the future. Get it all done, be done, and then you got your I last, mean, you know, yeah, month you, to crank on the other classes or whatever. Once you understand, like, kind of what assembly is and just being able to abstract out, like, the each function in and of itself and, like, look, look at each of that in detail and then know the... Uh, the like uh, just each command as long as you know what they do it's not difficult to do assembly so right it's a it's a kind of a mindset when the mindset clicks it's not it's not crazy difficult but the mindset yeah, you know that fluency just, has to click it's just <clears throat> a lot of wording is all that's so. right all right thanks dr k hey you bet take care all right we're a wrap